One of the strengths of the Raspberry Pi Pico is its ability to act as a HID, or human interface device. This means that this tiny board can become the brain for many devices such as a keyboard, mouse, or even a game controller. With the release of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge, I thought it was a great opportunity to build a 3D printed arcade stick to get that old school arcade feeling with the new game. And while I could use something like this zero delay arcade controller, I thought it would be even cooler to use the Pico to build something that can do a lot more than just be an arcade control. Today's build centers around a custom PCB I designed and was fabricated by the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. PCBWay is the all-in-one solution provider for your next project. Starting with custom PCB production, they offer boards starting at just $5 for 5 copies plus the cost of shipping. Plus, if it's your first time ordering from them, you get a $5 off coupon, making your first order free. One thing I love is that when you upload your board, it gives you a preview of your design right in the browser so you can make sure it looks good before you submit your order. In addition to PCB fabrication services, they offer many other ones, including CNC milling, 3D printing, and even PCB assembly, so your board arrives with all the components populated and ready to be used. You can check out PCB Way by clicking on the link in the description of this video. First, I modeled my Pico Cater board in KiCad, and then I sent it off to PCB Way for manufacturing. While I was waiting for it to arrive, I was able to import the PCB model into Fusion 360 and, from there, model an arcade controller around the design. I decided early on that I wanted to do a lot more than arcade stuff, so I included a spot for the same 128x64 OLED display that I included in the GamerPie RGB project from last year. Shortly after, the PCBs arrived from PCBWay and it was time to solder up some components. Looking over the Pico Cater board, you can see that I've split out the appropriate GPIO pins and coupled them with a ground pin. We'll set these pins to high in our code and that gives you everything you need to trigger a button press. I also added pins for analog signals, a few general purpose pins that have spots for resistors if you want to use them for LEDs, and a 4-pin connector for the I2C OLED display. I also designed it so that you can solder the Pico directly to the board, but I wanted to make it removable. So I started by soldering header pins to the Pico. I soldered the corners first to make sure that the pins are flush, and then I just went ahead and soldered the rest of the pins into place. Then it was time to populate the Pico cater board. I used female headers to create a socket for the Pico itself, which makes it a snap to insert and remove. With all the components installed, I also 3D printed a shell in this beautiful green PLA filament that feels perfect paired with a new Ninja Turtles game. Assembly is pretty simple. The 24mm arcade buttons just snap into place with a friction fit. The joystick is held in place with some M3 screws and some 3D printed washers. The OLED display is held in with some short M2 screws. The utility buttons above the joystick came with a retaining nut that inserts into the body of the joystick. Then you just screw the switch into place from the inside. I also added a spot for a micro USB to USB plug. This will help save on the wear and tear on the Pico while still giving you a removable cable on the back. And finally we mount the Pico cater board to the bottom of the fight stick and we're ready to wire it up. And wiring is pretty simple, at least for the buttons. You can connect up to 12 buttons simply by wiring them to B1 through B12 on the Pico Cater board. I used these 2 pin to quick disconnect cables that I had left over from some previous arcade builds, but you can just make your own. Clearances are a bit tight, so you might have to bend the quick disconnects to ensure that the bottom of the case fits properly. Using a wiring diagram I found online, as well as some male to female jumper cables, I connected each pin of the joystick to the signal pin for their corresponding direction on the Pico cater board, since the four directional switches share a common ground on the joystick. Then I connected all of the buttons to the proper headers on the board. I wired the mode switch button to the button labeled LCD enable on the Pico cater board. Then it was time to wire up the LCD itself. Now before closing up the bottom, you'll want to flash circuit python onto your Pico. This is done by holding down the boot select button while plugging your Pico into your computer. Then you can download the circuit python uf2 file from the link provided in the description of this video and copy it to the Pico. From there, you can close up the bottom and it's ready for programming. But before we jump into code, let's take a look at how the final product works. 
As expected, Shredder's Revenge plays absolutely great on the new arcade stick. And the game itself is awesome, feeling really close to the original arcade games. And speaking of which, loading the original TMNT arcade game into MAME and playing it using the stick feels like a blast from the past. Movements are nice and smooth and I don't really feel any delays. And by flipping my laptop onto its side, I was even able to play some 1943 without wasting too much of the LCD. Although the 24mm buttons we used on this build are smaller than the standard 32mm arcade buttons found on most cabinets, it still feels great and not too cramped at all. And since we've included all those extra buttons, it just made sense to give Mortal Kombat a shot. Unfortunately, it doesn't make me any better at the game, but I can hardly blame the controls. Of course, the reason we used the Pico was to have different usable modes, so let's take a look at what those look like. Keyboard mode maps the direction of the joystick to the arrow keys on your keyboard and the buttons to some commonly used buttons in retro games. This means you'll be able to use the Pico Cater when emulating a system that didn't have a joystick. FPS mode is similar, but it maps the directions to W, A, S, and D. It definitely won't help your Counter-Strike abilities, but it's still fun to try. Mouse mode is just that. You move the mouse cursor around with the joystick, button 1 is left click, and button 2 is right click. And finally, multimedia mode emulates the multimedia keys on an extended keyboard. Up and down on the joystick controls volume up and down, left and right moves you through your tracks, button 1 pauses, button 2 stops, and button 6 mutes. Now that you've seen how it all works, let's look at how to load this code and get it running on your Pico. Now unfortunately, at the time of making this video, the latest version of CircuitPython no longer includes the gamepad HID. But that's okay because we can re-add it by creating a file called boot.py that redefines what a gamepad is for the HID device. So the first thing we have to do is create a gamepad report descriptor. And essentially this is all of the description information that will be required for the computer to recognize your HID as a gamepad. It includes hex code that specifies things like the minimum and maximum number of buttons, the states for those buttons, the minimum and maximum for an analog stick, uh, the usage of those analog sticks, so we have an X and a Y, and various other pieces of information that tell it how to interact with the joystick. Then we define gamepad using the game descriptor as well as some other details, and finally we enable this device to be a keyboard, a mouse, a consumer controller which gives us our multimedia controls, and a gamepad. From there, we'll add this boot.py to our Pico, so we'll click File, Save As, when prompted we'll say CircuitPython device, and we will save it as boot.py. You'll also need the hit underscore gamepad.py provided by Adifruit Industries. So you'll download it from the description of this video and then again we'll do file, save as, and save it to the CircuitPython device. We'll also need from the CircuitPython libraries the Adifruit display text, Adifruit hid, Adifruit display IO SSD 1306, Adafruit Frame Buffer, and the Adafruit SSD 1306. So you'll go ahead and download the library files from the description of this video and then copy these over to the Pico in the lib folder. So we start off by importing our board support libraries right here, including the USB HID library. Next we import the libraries that will support the screen, including the one that provides our font and our connectivity. From time, we import sleep, which will allow us to add delays in our code later on. Next, we're going to need the libraries to support the keyboard. That includes the keyboard library itself, plus the layout, and key codes, which is essentially a lookup of all the keys available on the keyboard. We're also going to import HID Gamepad, and we're also going to import mouse so that this device can act as a mouse as well. And finally, for multimedia control, we have consumer control, as well as the consumer control codes, the same way as we have the key code for a regular keyboard. Then we start creating our objects, so we have a media control object, which will allow us to do media controls. We also have a keyboard object with a layout object and our gamepad object. We create a collection called button pins and this is a collection that contains all of the pins that are usable as pressable buttons on our gamepad. And then we have a collection containing the numbers for our gamepad buttons including our directionals. So if you were to use an analog stick you would actually be able to recover those four directionals and use them as regular buttons. Now we have some collections that show how different keys on our gamepad are going to map out to first keyboard buttons for keyboard mode. So you can see uh, 0 is up, 1 is left, 2 is down, and 3 is right. 
And it continues on like that. And you can change these to whatever you want. And when you push the corresponding direction or button on the joystick, it will then fire that key instead. FPS mode works exactly the same way. It's just different mappings. Then we have a collection that maps the different modes for the gamepad to numbers. So as you can see, mode one is gamepad, mode two is keyboard, and so on. And we set our default mode to one. Here we have the parameters for the screen. It's a 128 by 64 screen with a five pixel border all the way around it. Here we have our collection of buttons being established. And then we also have a mode change button, which in this case I have connected to the LCD enable pins on the Pico cater board, which is actually connected to GP22 on the Pico. We set the IO direction to input and we set the pull up resistor as on. So it'll always read high unless it's grounded out with a button press. And we do that same process for every button in the buttons collection, setting its direction to input and the pull-up resistor on. I've also got the analog X and analog Y set up here so that if you wanted to build a stick with analog, well, then you just need to sub these in later on. Here, we initialize the screen, including creating the I2C object for it and the display bus. And then we finally create our actual display object using the display bus as well as the provided width and height. And finally here, we put the default text on the screen in which case this will show mode one, which is gamepad mode. Now, sometimes in the code, we'll want to add a small pause after a button is pressed. This is because you can end up with a bounce and it'll register multiple key presses, even though you only meant one. So by adding a pause afterwards, it gives it a chance to clear the state and make sure that you don't get multiple presses when you only wanted one. So by creating a function called debounce, which then sleeps 0.2 of a second, we can just call here and it's essentially a constant all the way through our code. And if we want to change that speed later on, we can adjust this accordingly. And now we get to our main loop. So the first thing we want to do is check to see if the mode change button has been pressed. If it has, then we add one to our mode. If the mode is greater than five, since there's only five modes, well, then we roll it back down to one. And then we sleep for one second. Next, we update the display to show what mode the system is currently in. So that'll automatically change when the mode button is pressed. And now we get into the processing code. So if it's mode one, gamepad mode, the first thing we do is create a variable for X and Y that's set to zero. And then we iterate through the first four buttons, which are up, left, down, and right. If any of them are pushed, we set set X or set Y accordingly. And then finally, we send that value to the joystick. Other than that, we're just iterating through the buttons on the gamepad. And we ignore the first four since those are directional. But other than that, if a button's value is still high, meaning it's not being pressed, we do a release on that button. And otherwise we do a press, so that button shows up as pressed. Next, we move into keyboard mode and it's even simpler. Since we don't have to worry about setting the gamepad up, left, down, and right, all we have to do is iterate through the buttons. So if a button is released, we do a keyboard.release for that button. And so we have keyboard buttons at the top, which is the collection, and that corresponds to I. So we can look up the keyboard button value that we want by using I. And we do the same lookup for the press, except for we trigger the keyboard press instead. FPS mode works exactly the same way and it's just doing a different lookup. It's looking up in FPS buttons instead of keyboard buttons. For mode four, it's a bit different, but it's more similar to the gamepad. So we're checking the values for the directionals and then moving the mouse in the direction that the joystick is currently pushed. On top of that, we look up the first and second button values. And if the first button has been pressed, that's a left click. And if the second button has been pressed, that's a right click. And for mode five, well, it's all sort of just hard coded here. So we look up the values for up and down and do volume increase or decrease, depending on which way it's been pushed. We also look for left and right and do previous and next track according to that. And then we map button one to play, button two to stop and button six to mute. Now we just need to get this code onto the Pico. Now we could just run it from here and that would work, but if we want this to automatically show up as a usable gamepad when we boot it up, we're going to need to install the code onto the Pico. So we'll click File, Save As, Circuit Python Device, and here we'll just type in code.py. And then after unplugging and plugging your device back in, it'll come up in gamepad mode and as you can see from this test, it now works without any additional steps. Overall, I'm really happy with the way this turned out. It's compact, it plays great, and I'm looking forward to being able to expand its functionality. What do you think of the design? Let me know in the comments below. And thanks for watching this build. What would you like to see added? Let me know. And special thanks to my Patreon supporters for making builds like this possible.
That's it for this one, but until next time, stay creative.